Fund management can be a tough business. Sometimes skill in managing others' money isn't quite enough. Distribution, the client base, and the ability to attract capital from the word go is as important for survival of an asset manager. Now throw in BE and it can make it that much more interesting. Tonight we have Massimo Magaran, the MD of Mergent Investment Managers, joining us to discuss some findings of this 27.4 BEE survey. Massimo, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll start off with you and just get some background to Mergent Investment Managers. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you fit into the BE asset management space? Yeah, our Mergent is a boutique asset manager uh, based in Cape Town. We started the company in 2004. It's 100% black owned um, and it's got a, a high PDI of management in, in the group, uh, roughly about 70%. Uh, we've got like six uh, managers, portfolio managers, and uh, five of those are, are PDI uh, candidates. Uh, the company's grown from roughly uh, 500 million in 2004 to roughly 9 billion rands today. Uh, we manage uh, a spectrum of, of products, uh, one being the uh, Absolute Return Fund, which has been our flagship. Um, and out of that, we've um, spawned the long only funds. And uh, lately, uh, we've uh, something that speaks to our philosophy of creating shared value in South Africa. We've spawned the uh, impact funds, and later I'll be talking more about the renewable energy fund. That, of course, is a particular passion of yours and interest. Uh, but let's talk about uh, the BE space right now, because just looking at the numbers, um, in terms of total assets under management in the industry of around 3.37 trillion, um, BE asset managers only account for 5.47 percent of this. But we've seen considerable growth since 2009, around 75, 79 percent, in fact, growth in the m number of black fund managers. Uh, tell us about this growth, but why it's still relative small when you look at the total industry size? Look, uh, the growth is relatively small and I, I think asset managers as a whole, uh, regardless of being black, face a number of issues. And one is uh, obviously brand or brand perceptions, especially when competing with, uh, with more established companies. The second is the ability to attract uh, uh, talent and, and, uh, and retain talent, most, m more importantly. And that's always a function of your balance sheet. But I think, as you say, the, the, the numbers uh, speak to, to, they speak a certain story, and that story is the slow, slow pace of, uh, of transma transformation in our industry. I think one of the biggest challenges uh, we bring as, as a society at times, especially from a professional and, and social engagement, is that uh, we bring certain preconceived notions and, and perceptions and sometimes the merit of the argument is, is put aside. So I think the biggest challenge for black uh, asset managers is, is overcoming some of those uh, perceptions around competence, especially in the financial industry. You know, it could potentially also, I mean, I, I think many of the issues that Massimo has kind of raised uh, tonight is, is certainly very, very important. But I think maybe concentration and skill is something else that you potentially need to take into consideration. We have a graph uh, that we'd like to show you that just shows you that concentration. Again, this comes from the 27.4 uh, BE survey. And if you just have a look at that, you'll see that most of the concentration actually happens in what we call the long only space. That would be kind of your normal asset classes that you would be kind of used to. 2009, you can see how many participants were in this space, whereas today you can see there's, there's over 17 participants in this space. But look at the hedge funds and private equity and all the way through to hedge fund, uh, kind of the hedge fund industry. You'll see that, you know, that those numbers then change completely. Massimo, maybe a question for you. Do you think there's a concentration in skill as far as BE asset managers are concerned? Uh, is it not maybe time that more of them start diversifying into hedge funds and maybe other areas rather than just concentrating on long only? No, I certainly think so. I think there is a con concentration in the long only space. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, one is obviously the space itself um, uh, has a large pool of assets. Uh, the institutional mandates in this space are, are pretty huge. But, but again, I think globally, not only in, in South Africa, there's an aura around the, uh, the long only space. I, I think if an asset manager can beat his peers and, and beat his benchmark repeatedly, um, one, one derives some kind of, um, some kind of uh, intellectual distinction uh, around your brand. And that too attracts, attracts uh, a lot of flows and, and scalability. Uh, but lastly, I, I think over time, the long only space has shown itself to to beat inflation quite comfortably. And I think that's why it attracts 
uh, young entrants into the market. Massimo, uh, from my side, just a question in terms of any new industry where there's lots of growth uh, initially is seen in, in numbers, as in more and more of um, sort of competing firms. Then one enters a phase where you have more of a consolidation happening and you end up with you know, three or four big sort of uh, dominating firms. Uh, how far are we away from consolidation and sort of uh, um, you know, clustering of assets into, uh, into much bigger firms? I think that's uh, obviously a natural evolution and, and you've seen some this year. I think in the next five, five to ten years you might see more consolidation. But that consolidation will take place in very homogeneous type of products. I think as boutique asset managers would like to think we, we distinct in our offering uh, and therefore trying to merge two different philosophies becomes very diffi difficult, especially from a, a, from a cultural point of view but also from a a philosophy, investment philosophy point of view. So I think there'll always be room for boutique managers. I mean, I, th I think the other thing to take into consideration here as well is just kind of the investor base that kind of lends itself to black economic uh, kind of uh, asset management firms. It's probably been institutional. Again, just have a look at the graph on your screen, again from the survey, and you'll see that the majority of clients really come from the institutional space. These are pension funds, uh, maybe provident funds, anybody kind of in the institutional space. It kind of makes up the majority of the client base, whereas retail really makes up a very, very small portion of the total client base. Uh, Massimo, again, you know, going back in time, you know, as the codes kind of changed for BE and it started fluxing into the industry, we started seeing a lot of pension funds saying, look, we need to invest with an emerging manager. And certainly we've seen the flows as far as that's concerned. What are you guys doing or what is the industry maybe importantly doing in order to kind of more track kind of that retail money? Is that something that you guys are working on? Yeah, it certainly is. And, and I think it's part of your natural evolution as you go up your growth curve. Uh, I think there are two reasons why this has been uh, institutionally driven. Uh, one is obviously peristatals and, and unions and, and retirement funds are highly politicized environment and they, environments and they've been pretty vociferous in art articulating a transformational agenda. Uh, they haven't reached their targets but certainly in, in their policies and in their objectives uh, that like there's a desire there to see a significant portion of their funds being managed by um, black asset managers. And I think that will continue, at least for the next five to 10 years. Um, secondly, as to retail, uh, I think as you know, personal savings in South Africa are, are skewed demographically. Uh, so for black asset managers to tap into a huge network of, 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 of black investors on a retail la level is, is often very difficult. But having said that, I think with uh, performance uh, over time and, and sustainability of brand, one will be able to, to finally bre break into, into the unit trust industry and the retail industry. Massimo, in, uh, we've seen uh, the, the original sort of BE asset management firms have been generally focused on, on sort of passive kind of uh, strategies, the, the Cajisos and the Vunanis. Uh, um, what's your view on, on the growth in terms of BE passive versus active management? Uh, is there still a a, a big growth look uh, going forward in terms of active management because there's, there's so little out there at this stage? Like I said, I, I think uh, active management uh, is an attraction. Uh, it yields better fees uh, from a business model and a business decision uh, perspective. If, if you think you have the capability and the skills in-house uh, to generate alpha from, from active management, I think that's going to continue. Uh, I think there will be room for, for passive management, especially in, in the markets such as we've seen, uh, you know, an, an age of deleveraging, of an age of high indebtedness, and an age of uh, volatility. I think there will be room for uh, more passive kind of uh, investments. I mean, the other thing that I think we need to look at is just kind of how well do the do BE fund managers actually score as far as the DTI codes are concerned. Just look at, uh, look at the graph on your screen at the moment, you'll see the DTI, these are now the scores or the targets for black economic empowerment in South Africa and it shows you the 25 asset managers that are deemed to be black asset managers and it just shows you how they kind of score. They score fairly highly as far as ownership, management, control and employment equity is concerned. So those are kind of the big scores but down at the bottom socioeconomic development, skills development and enterprise development is something where they don't score that high. Massimo, is this, is this something that kind of rings true to you in the industry? Um, what, what do you think the industry is, should be doing about this? I, I think to a certain extent it does. 
Uh, in, in our experiences as merchants, there's been a direct correlation uh, between our asset growth and our revenue growth and, and the amount of capital spend uh, we, we allocate towards enterprise development and, and skills development. Um, as I said, I think um, this is a, a business of people around, around a process and uh, inherent and intrinsic in, in that uh, will have to uh, invest in, in, in human capital or recruit the best talent out there. So I think that comes as you evolve, uh, as you evolve your business. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's so interesting because, I mean, if you think about it from a pension fund perspective, you know, pension funds don't necessarily just give one manager all their money. Yeah. They usually choose a couple of managers in order to do so. So how a BE firm fits in from a return profile with, a, with just a, a kind, of the, the kind of lock, stock and standard names that we know in the industry and how they potentially complement those and how you make utilize and how you utilize those and use those become, you know, classically kind of very, very important for, for pension funds. And only time will really unlock that. And kind of coming back to what Massimo said just now. Uh, it's time that unlocks that and unlocks the, the, the showing what the performance potential in many of these organizations can be. And I suppose really another question is, is you know, getting the skills into these boutique firms as opposed to going to the well-established, you know, big brand names in the industry. Um, and that, of course, will grow with time but as these firms also grow. Um, so Massimo, let's just go back to that. Uh, we talked about, you know, getting new skills. Just reiterate, um, you know, what you're doing, I suppose, from emergency point of view to kind of attract these this, this young talent into the company and you know how hard is it as opposed to getting them uh, how hard is it to basically attract them versus um, the kind of uh, packages they might receive from these bigger firms yeah that, that, that is one of the biggest challenges I, I think established uh, firms can easily poach good talent uh, we've we've been fortunate at emergence that the core of the team has stayed the same and I think that speaks more to our philosophy as a house and, and how we treat uh, our people. Uh, we've been able to, to bring in two top names that we couldn't afford maybe a year ago. But uh, as you go through a certain, a certain point in, in, in your assets under management, uh, a certain revenue base, you are able to accommodate those skills. Uh, like I say, th this year for us, uh, we've been able to balance the youth in our team uh, yeah. with, with experience, and that experience costs. Just looking at the survey um, and ESG, environmental, social and governance factors, it seems to be an increased awareness of the importance of incorporating um, these concepts and this kind of um, investment philosophy into your process. But it seems like governance is uh, a lot more high on the agenda than for, for you know, g environmental per se. Well, I mean, if you think about the environmental angle, it really is a new angle for asset management. You know, the instruments that are available in that space is probably much less than what you have in the traditional asset class space. So hence, in the past, when you were an asset manager, you started in a traditional space and you kind of evolved yourself. Whereas, you know, if, I think if you start off brand new today, it doesn't matter if you're going to be an empowered asset manager, you're not going to be an empowered asset manager, you're probably going to find it difficult to kind of attract assets because it's a two-edged sword. You walk into an investor and you say, can I please manage some of your money? And they say, well, you've got all your licensing. What's your track record? And you say, well, I don't have a track record. Then I say, well, then I can't give you any assets. And once you have a track record, then they say, well, what skill have you got? Um, you know, we can ascertain the skill from a performance perspective, but have you got a brand name fund manager that you could show me? Mm. You know, and that costs money at the end of the day. So this is invariably just an industry that has just kind of cost money to run. And part of that cost is obviously running unit trust. And if you just look at the graph, uh, on your screen at the moment, you'll see just the number of unit trusts that have listed or are available to the industry participants. These are now predominantly BE fund managers. Started off with only eight in 2009, and it's now gone over 12. I mean, 13, shall I rather say? And I mean, that's a that's a growing kind of evolution. Yeah. You want to see guys kind of enter that retail space, have their products out, uh, you know, it's, out it's in the market. It's still small though, because the the total number of unit trusts is 1,200. So it's it's still a very small proportion. But yeah, and if you take it is growing. And if you take into consideration that there's 25 participants in this uh, in this specific survey, you know, there's very few unit trusts going around. Hopefully, we can see this exponentially growing over time. M Massimo, let's get back to um, impact invest investing rather and uh, you know I brought up ESG factors incorporating that into your investment process so tell us a little bit more about um, the role that that plays um, at Mergence. Yeah we were the first signatories of the the UNPRI um, and we, we we did collaborate in, 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 in uh, contributing to the CRESA codes uh, before they were finalized um, 
at Mergence, I think as a group too, as a, I think there's a common thread that runs through the group and, and uh, that philosophy is around creating shared value, um, focusing on making profits whilst addressing social needs. And in that philosophy emanated uh, our SRI, our, our SRI products. Um, and uh, you know, they, they speak to, we'd like to define ourselves within the national conversation, uh, the public discourse. And that discourse speaks to the structural issues in our country, uh, whether it be uh, the income disparities in our country, whether it be the huge unemployment in, uh, in our country, whether it be the educational crisis, uh, whether it be the energy shortages. And through our impact funds, um, we've been able to uh, innovate uh, certain, certain products that, that, that speak to or that try and address those structural issues.